Uh, as we start today, I want to just uh, spend a little bit of time talking about your translation of Genesis chapter 3. You have uh, the first two sections graded and returned to you, and you have comments on them. And I want to just talk to you about uh, the lessons that we learn from translating Genesis 3. So the first lesson we learn is when in doubt, translate. Uh, for example, the uh, direct object marker eighth is not translated. And so uh, that's a particle you will not necessarily translate. But most of the other things you need to be certain that you translate. Uh, pay attention to the particles, pay attention to pronominal suffixes. Try to make certain you represent everything. Don't omit phrases. Uh, don't uh, work in such a way that you skip phrases or clauses. Make certain you represent a translation of everything in the text. Uh, think what your translation means. Think what it implies. Uh, put your mind to it. Does that make sense to you? And the help in that is to read it aloud. If you read it aloud, you can listen to it carefully and you'll pick up things that you normally do not pick up uh, just by listening to it, reading it aloud. Sometimes having your wife or your children read it to you helps or you're reading it to them. Uh, reading aloud helps to point out those problems and someone will say, well, that doesn't make sense or this is ambiguous. This could have two different meanings. Uh, do not use now unless it is the Hebrew ata. We mentioned that back on Genesis 3.1 with the wow conjunction beginning a section. Now should be preserved for that which means the present time or right now. Uh, don't try to use a logical now. Uh, it's too ambiguous in the English. When it comes to translating the wayuk toll verbs, do not translate and, 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 and. Uh, instead, if you have a disjunctive, use but or however. Disjunctives, however, are with disjunctive clauses where you have wow plus non-verbs. Uh, you do have a few rare examples of wayuk tol being used adversatively or with, as a disjunctive, but you will not have that in any of your current assignments for this course. The text you're dealing with do not use it that way. It is used that way in some other texts. The wayuk tol should be translated to show sequence. Use words like then, so, thus and therefore. Determine which one you choose by the context. Stative verbs. When you come to stative verbs like haya or yare, he was afraid, or kadash, to be holy, remember that the statives must be translated as uh, become something if it's in the imperfect. Become, came to be, or happened. Whereas in the perfect, it's the idea of was, is, or shall be. So the imperfect stative is what we call a dynamic stative. It is in process, becoming, a state of becoming. Become, came to be, or happened. The perfect is a state of being, was, is, or shall be. So if you have, uh, I heard you, uh, the, your sound in the garden, uh, so I was afraid. No, I became afraid because it's an imperfect. I became afraid. Also, we've learned to use paragraphing. Uh, all of you in this class are using the paragraphing properly at this point. Only a couple of you are struggling with some of the decisions on making paragraphs, but everyone's trying to use proper paragraphs. Remember, as you see here in this example from a children's book, that a paragraph occurs every time you change speaker. So where you have, what's happened, I ask, where's on, on Andrea? That's one person speaking. The answer that Ginny gives, come and see all of you, is a separate paragraph. And then when the next paragraph comes, at the edge of the brush, we could see Andrea and with her was Looney Coon. That is giving a different topic, a different subject. And so it's a different paragraph. Then you have Wuzzling, I exclaimed. And then, yes, Wuzzling, Jenny agreed. These are two separate paragraphs. New speaker, new paragraph. New topic, new paragraph. New grammatical subject, new paragraph. The next night, a new subject. It's not someone. It's not I. It's not Jenny. It's the next night. When we saw Andrea, it's we are seeing, not I, not Jenny. Then it has to be a separate paragraph. So follow that along, and especially with conversations, make certain you give proper paragraphing. Do not translate across the conjunction wow or its accents in Genesis 3, 6, and 7. In 3, 6, we have, so she gave also to her husband with her, then, he, uh, then, then uh, she took, uh, and, or he took, excuse me, and he ate. He took it an eight. Uh, when you look at that, 
you have imach. Notice that imach comes before the wayiktol of watikach. Therefore, imach cannot be translated after watikach. Watikach has to be kept separate and all by itself. You cannot bring something from before it into it. What's before it has to stay before it. And so here, Imach has to go with Le'isha, to her husband, to her husband with her. You can't translate that as he took with her or he ate with her. The with her stays only with the previous phrase. In 3.7, then the eyes of the two of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. We can't take the two of them, Shanehem, and put it afterwards and say, and the two of them knew that they were naked. Because Shanehem has a zakef katon over it, a disjunctive accent. It is before the wayik tol, so it has to stay before the wayik tol. And notice it's also connected to a ne, which is a noun, masculine, plural construct. The munach accent is the uh, strongest conjunctive accent. So it means eyes of the two of them has to stay together. You cannot separate Shanehem from Ene. So don't cross over the wow conjunction. Don't cross over the major accents in doing translation. Keep the parts where they belong. Uh, the, the, the form Ayeka in 3.9. Where are you? It's made up of A, the interrogative where, and then the full spelling of Ka. The final He there, the comet's He, under the kaf is just spelling out the second masculine singular pronominal suffix. Before there were vowel pointings, the he was used as a vowel letter, the matres lexionis, the, the mother of reading, in, to enable pronunciation. So even before there were vowel pointings, there were clues as to how to pronounce it, and this was the clue that that is a second masculine singular pronominal suffix. When you translate, all the words are to be in standard type, not italics. You is there in the text, in the second masculine singular pronominal suffix, do not italicize. Where is a, do not italicize. R is the necessary copula. Necessary copulas are not italicized. We do not say, where are you? We say, where are you? And in the Hebrew, the sense was the same. And it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary. You cannot accurately translate this without the R. Therefore, it is not placed in italics. Pay attention to pronominal suffixes, like the third masculine singular on the preposition min, mimenu, from it, or the third feminine singular pronominal suffix on the verb tokalenna, you shall eat it. Be certain to identify those, that to identify that the noon is the connector, and the noon takes a dogish in it to distinguish it, from other forms that might have a noon and a shurik as in mimenu. If you had no dogish in the noon, then you might suspect that that was a first common plural type of suffix instead of a third masculine singular, singular suffix. Pay attention to verb gender and number. Tatsmiyach, uh, uh, it shall sprout. That is a hyphial imperfect third feminine singular. The antecedent is the ground or the earth. And so you must translate it that way. It's not that the thorn and thistle sprout. It's the ground causes the thorn and thistle to sprout. Pay attention to emphatic personal pronouns. So that in the text, as in 3.12, we have he not nali. She herself gave to me. Or in 3.15, uh, where we have he himself will wound you with regard to the head but you will wound him with regard to the heel. Now we do not take the second uh, personal pronoun as emphatic and translate it as you yourself because it is put forward and used in order to give a disjunctive clause situation. It provides a wow conjunction plus non-verb so that we can see a contrast here between the two individuals and their actions. So the contrast is the emphasis, not the pronoun itself, as in the first case. And then in 3.16, but he will rule over you. That he is not emphatic as he himself, but it's emphatic by contrast, but he will rule over you. Uh, and when we're talking about that particular situation, this is the, the 
passage where we're looking at it and saying, okay, uh, when we're saying he will rule over you, that is a promise. It is something good. We think that we're in a section that's dealing with a curse. But here we have a promise within that curse. In fact, we have several promises within this curse. And in this case, your husband will continue to rule over you in the same fashion as he was made your head even before the fall. This will continue. It gives continuity. It gives security. It's a promise to the woman. She will be cared for by her provider, by her husband. And then in 3.20, uh, because she herself was, notice the perfect of Hayah, was the mother of all living or all life. Pay attention to the grammatical sense. Herba erbe its bonek weheronek. As we look at this, we have a situation in which we have a hifil, uh, infinitive, absolute, followed by a hifil, imperfect, first common singular from Rava. And so it is intensive. I will certainly multiply your pain or your sorrow and your conception or and your pregnancy. Now note that this is not, first of all, the, pay attention to the grammar and sense. We're looking here that we have a wow conjunction between the two nouns. The two direct objects of the emphatic verb, I will greatly increase or multiply. And both of them have a second feminine singular pronominal suffix. Your pain and your conception. And that means this cannot be a hendiatus. It's not your painful conception. It's not uh, talking about your conception or, or your pain in childbirth. There are two nouns. They are identified as separate and distinct by means of the second feminine singular pronominal suffixes. Therefore, it's talking about two distinct things. And that brings us to this point of the meaning of this in the context in the midst of a curse. First of all, I will greatly increase implies that there is already pain and there is already conception. Before the fall, Eve had the power to conceive a child through by Adam. Uh, she, she and he were both told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But now that the fall has taken place and the fall seems to have taken place before she actually conceived physically, the first result is what? The first result is death. That means then that the man and woman are not going to live as long as God had originally designed or intended. If that's so then, how in the world will they be able to fulfill that mandate unless he does something? And he does. He says, I will increase your conception. Perhaps before the fall in her perfect state, Eve would bear a child and maybe she would not conceive again for a year or two. Unlike today when your wife can bear a child and two weeks later get pregnant again. Uh, why that rapidness of conception now? In order that mankind would have the opportunity to fulfill God's mandate. It's his grace being manifested. Instead of keeping them to the same pattern that he had designed before the fall. Uh, this, I'm going to stop right there Josh. Is that where you were talking about or had we gone one step further? Okay. Uh, had we gone on to talk about the, the bearing of, of children as uh, sons and, and daughters? Did okay, I'll, I'll quickly do it just in case because it's so closely connected I don't know where the break point was. Okay. okay. So in that passage, I will greatly multiply your pain, your conception. We see that promise of God together with what your wife would say is a somewhat of a uh, curse. Uh, increase in pain in childbirth and uh, perhaps increased conceptions. Maybe she'd like to have a break occasionally. And so that could be looked at in a negative way. But overall, it's a positive influence here. And remember, that's because Eve was deceived, unlike Adam, who sinned purposefully. And uh, she did not bring sin to the world. He did. And uh, death does not come through her. It comes through him. The sin nature is not passed on by her. It's passed on by him. And so the fact that her so-called curse statement here given by God uh, is mainly promise and mainly good is not then uh, unusual. It's just again God's grace. She was deceived. She was tricked. The words curse are only used with regard to the serpent and with regard to the man's parts, not with regard to the woman. This next phrase, uh, do not translate it as sons. 
Otherwise, you'll, your wife's going to say uh, that uh, you don't understand childbirth, that a daughter's birth is just as painful as a son's. Banim can refer to sons, males only. It can refer to children. Uh, it can refer to descendants. It can refer to peoples. Here, by context, it's obviously referring to children, both male and female. And when it says, in pain you will bear children, notice here the word order in English uh, is a protective as well as the Hebrew word order of making certain we don't translate it as saying you will bear children in pain or children with pain making it sound like the children are in pain so watch your word order so that you catch that and make certain it's correct yes sir the, I would really multiply your pain and your conception yes. so your pain and your conception are viewed as two so how, how does he how does he greatly multiply conception yeah Stop to think a minute. What happened with the fall? Just think theologically. What happened with the fall? What, what are the results of the fall? Anyone? First result of the fall is what? Death. death. Okay, death. So man is going to live a shorter amount of time than God originally planned. So if he's living a shorter amount of time, how is he going to be able to fulfill God's mandate to multiply and be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth? God in his grace multiplied and increased the fertility of Eve and of other women in order that they might be able to fulfill his mandate even though they're fallen. You see, we think of this as all a curse. But gentlemen, it's not all curse. In every part of this curse, there's also grace. Look back at chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 when God spoke to the serpent and he says you'll be cursed more than any of the domestic animals and more than all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, you'll eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. And then what does he say? He gives a promise. He gives a promise that even is talked about in Galatians chapter 4 as the promised seed of the woman in which a deliverer will come who will deliver from the effects of the curse. You have a promise in 315, the Protevangelium, the first gospel. You have a promise there. In speaking to the woman, much of what she has is promise. Very little of it is curse. Why would that be? Well, what does Paul say about the woman? She did not transgress, he said, because she was deceived. Sin did not enter the world through Eve's, trend, uh, through her disobedience. It entered through Adam's disobedience. Death did not come because of the woman's disobedience. It came because of the man's disobedience. God is showing now his grace toward her and showing how it is that the sin nature is passed on by the man and not the woman. And so that which is spoken to the woman does not use the word curse at all, number one, where the word curse occurs in both the statements made to the serpent and to the man. The woman, instead, is given much that is positive to show the grace of God. And your wife may say, well, I don't look at it as a real positive thing that instead of having a year or two break between pregnancies that I can conceive in just a few weeks after giving birth, uh, I don't look at that as a great blessing. And she might wish her husband were a little bit more careful about that or that you did spend a little bit more time in planning. Uh, and she may, might say that uh, the pain of childbirth is not something that's real pleasant either. All right? But notice that pain of childbirth existed before. Because that which is increased is the pain as well as the conception. So it's just an increase over what would have been there in the unfallen state. Because man was created by God with nerves and nerve endings. And there would be natural pain. If Adam reached up to the lemon tree to grab a lemon and hit his hand on a thorn, believe me, he felt it. There was pain. And it was not the result of sin. And pain is not all the result of sin. And so uh, that's just the natural way God created man so that he might be protected and the body be preserved alive. 
So there are things there that are a little bit different in what your wife may, may agree with you and say, well, that's not all a tremendous blessing. But as you look at it, there is much that is a blessing. Notice that Adam is head of his wife and she must submit to him even before the fall. Paul explains that in great detail in case we don't understand it in uh, 1 Corinthians. And after the fall, he will continue to rule over you. God did not change the dynamics of the home and the marital relationship because of the fall. He maintained the same structural order as before. That's a blessing. Otherwise, it could have been destroyed. Eric? I don't want to take on a rabbit trail, but uh, when you were talking about Eve being deceived in, in 1 Timothy 2, where the part of, as I understand it, the reason she is not to exercise authority or preach is because she was the one who was deceived. That's part of the reason. Right. She's, that's another reason why she's called the weaker vessel at times. Right. It's not that she's weaker physically. And some women could take any of us down. <laughs> <laughs> take us out, you know. Uh, try keeping up with Allison Felix running uh, 200 meters. You're not going to do it, guys. She's world class. So it's not a matter of, sp of uh, physical strength. It's the idea <coughs> of uh, another weakness within the nature and being of a woman. A greater weakness of being deceived, perhaps? I wouldn't go that far. <coughs> yeah. I'll leave that to New Testament. All right, someone else had a question? Yes, sir. I said, what, when like Paul says, um, for the woman was deceived and not the man, isn't that more, well, just asking more that the woman... Uh, She stepped out of her place. She took the leadership role, the spiritual leadership role, obviously, in the fall. And the man followed, and that's, like, she stepped out of her place, and that's more kind of what he's talking about, as opposed to, like, women are more gullible, you know? Uh, I wouldn't say that, no, because the woman being deceived was tricked by Satan. She did not purposely or intentionally step out of her role of submission to her husband. Okay. Yes, sir. Just a quick question. Uh, are there any translations that would render Genesis 3, uh, 3.16 as, as you have put it? Yeah, I posted it for you on the uh, course webpage okay. under course documents. It's my translation. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I mean, what I meant is, is you know, the... the you can, the you can find parts of it in a variety of different translations, but no translation is consistent all the way through. Probably even mine is inconsistent if you look at it carefully and still needs revision, although I've been revising it constantly for the last 15 years. Okay? No translation is perfect, even that one. Be aware. All right? Do not translate na as we beseech or I pray or please. If it's please, make certain it's a proper context. Make certain that it seems necessary. Don't have a king saying please to a slave. All right? That's a real clue that na does not mean please. Now, if the slave uses na in speaking to the king, it might very well mean please. So watch that very carefully. Do not translate introductory imperatives. Introductory imperatives are like when we say cum lake. Arise, go. The arise, the cum, is not to be translated. It's just go with a sense of urgency. It means go immediately. Let me give you an example from your own home. Let's say you have a two-level home, Sunday morning. The kids are upstairs. You're downstairs. You're all ready to leave for church. Your wife is getting ready to walk out the door. The kids are still playing upstairs. And you look up at your son who's standing up there in the hallway next to the banister on the railing there. And you say, hurry up and come down. As what, what does your son say to you? Because he's a literalist like you, he says, Dad, that's impossible. I cannot hurry up and come down. <laughs> all right? And what do you say? When I say hurry up, that's a figure of speech. I don't mean literally hurry up. I mean get down here right now, right? That is an introductory imper uh, imperative. It's not to be taken literally. And that's the same with Coom Lake. The only time it's to be taken literally is where the context is explicit in that nature. For example, you have the uh, concubine of the person, the Levite, in the time of the judges. 
who is left outside and the townsmen have their way with her and, and leave her half dead on the doorstep. And he gets up in the morning and opens the door and starts to step out and he says to her, he says, kumi laki. What does he mean? It's literal. She's lying on the, th- on the threshold. She's half dead. So he means literally get up. The context will indicate. But in most cases, those are introductory imperatives not to be translated, but to be taken as a sense of urgency, just like your hurry up is when you tell your son to come downstairs. Questions to ask while you're doing translation in your study, and we're going to enter a lab session in just a few minutes. In the lab session, we're going to work on syntactical analysis of your passages, your chosen passages. How do you approach this task? How do you think about it? What do you do about translating your passage? What do you do about analyzing your passage? That's what I want to talk to you about next. Question? Um, when, when we're translating into English, is it, you know, we have a lot of uh, pictures in uh, Hebrew, but we also have pictures in our own English language, like, like hurry up. Is it right, right to translate into an English uh, picture? Uh, in some cases, yes. In that particular case, uh, hurry up and go is a perfectly good one. Yes, Mm -hmm. and it's using an idiomatic equivalent and actually it's not a uh, it's not uh, what we would call a dynamic equivalence it is an exact formal equivalence because you're using another imperative to replace an imperative and it's very clear that both imperatives are being used in a non-literal sense Uh, so that's that works very well questions to ask when I don't understand what I read. You say you've been reading in the Hebrew and you're having difficulty understanding. Let me share with you what my third grade grandson brought home from his school as a third grader. All right? When it doesn't sound right, ask yourself. These are the rules he had. His teacher laminated them and he brought them home. Ask yourself, do I need to sound out the words? Same with Hebrew. Do you need to sound it out? You've got to be able to sound it out. And if you sound it out, you may avoid a mistake. Do other words in the text give me clues to the unknown word that I'm having problems with? Does this sound like language? (laughs) Think of that when you're reading your translation. Do I need to slow down and reread? What is the author trying to tell me? This is on the uh, website under the course documents, the whole thing, so you have it there. What is happening here? Ask yourselves these questions. It'll help you to better understand what you're translating, the text that you are analyzing. Ask yourself, what do I already know that is like what the author is saying? What do I know about this kind of text? Is it a story? Is it a history? Is it a poem? What is my purpose for reading? Why am I reading it? What is important for me to understand? The big question, so what? Don't know a word? What should you do? Try to sound out the word first. Sound it out. Pronounce it aloud. Look at the beginning letters. Look at the ending letters. Look for a smaller word in the word. That's the root word in Hebrew. The root word in Hebrew. Skip the word and read the sentence to the end. The context might suddenly tell you without even looking it up in a lexicon what it has to mean. What should you do? Try to guess. What word makes sense? That's the key. When you guess, make sense with your guess. Does your guess look like the word you see? Use the word around it. Go back and reread. Does it sound right? Put another word in its place. See what sense it makes then. See how it changes. Ask a friend. Look in the dictionary. You know what I told him? I said, Nick, when I was your age, look in the dictionary was number one. I'd come home and I'd ask my mother and she'd say, there's the dictionary, go look it up for yourself. 
I'd ask my dad, thinking, okay, I got dad pegged here. I got him cornered. He doesn't want me to mess around with his time. He'll give me the answer and let me go on with my homework. No way. He was the same. They were, they were dedicated to that task. Use the dictionary. That's why we bought it for you. <laughs> when we had an encyclopedia set, I got the same answer there as well. Now, all this was in my grandson's third grade class. His third grade reading teacher put all of those instructions on a bookmark for him to keep with him as he read. Now, gentlemen, if you have third graders in your home, that's what they're learning in school. Do you dare have a different practice than what you learn? You know, you've got to stop to think about these things. And it reminds me of that TV program. You know, if it works for a third grader, why not for us? The TV program, are you smarter than a third grader? Are you smarter than a third grader in approaching Hebrew? Or would your third grader, without being taught Hebrew, without having a year of Hebrew, look at you and say, Dad, that translation doesn't make any sense? Okay? So remember that. It's kind of humorous in a way, but it's a serious note. And uh, believe me, our children sometimes are doing a better job of being educated and learning than we are. So it behooves us to pay attention and try to do something different. When we're talking about the Hebrew verb system, we stopped on the PL and PUAL and the factative use at the end of last cl class time. We had stopped here at Genesis 2-3, where Yikadesh Oto, then he sanctified it. In the English, any noun or any verb, excuse me, that ends in an IFY, classify, sanctify, those are causative uh, verbs. Those are causatives dealing with a state of being, bringing something into a state. To sanctify is to bring something into the state of being holy. To classify is to bring something into the state of being connected with a particular class or category. So, and you can have the same thing with I-Z-E verbs. Categorize is just like classify. The I-Z-E has the same meaning. In the Greek, katharizo means to bring into a state of being clean or to make clean. Hagiadzo is to sanctify. And so we have the I-Z-E used in English as well. And you also have the I-F-Y. So it's a factative. A factative means he brought it into the state or condition of being holy. If you look at Kadash in Holiday on page 313, you find out that it's translated, <coughs> excuse me, you find out that it is translated be holy. Whenever you have a be in the translation gloss in the lexicon, that means it's a stative verb. So if it's a stative verb in the cal that the lexicon says you need the, the verb form be to translate it, then in the pl that verb is most often a factative. And so it'll be translated in this fashion. So the subject of the pl verb brings the object of that verb into the state or condition expressed by the cal stative of that verb. So as here, the pl here, God's the subject, He's the subject. He brings the object, the seventh day, into the state of or condition that is expressed by the cal stative be holy. So he is bringing into the state of being holy, the condition of being holy or sanctifying. That's what a factative verb is. So when you have a pl or a pu'al verb in your passages, you need to ask yourself that question. Is this verb a stative verb in the cal stem? Look in the lexicon and find out. If it is, then you have to ask yourself a question. Is it then being used as a factative in my text? And what is the resultant meaning? Then there's other uses of the PL and PUL. For example, in Genesis 23, 19, Kaver Avraham et Sarah. Abraham buried Sarah. Cal perfect third masculine singular. But we have in Genesis 25, 10, Kuver Avraham with Sarah. Abraham and Sarah were buried. But notice it's a pu'al perfect third masculine singular. Why did it change to a pu'al? Well, first of all, it's passive. But why, why the pl or pu'al instead of a cal? Because one of the intensive, quote unquote, concepts within the pl and pu'al is what is known as the plural of the or iterative. 
plurative or iterative. It means to do something more than once. But we have another problem because in Genesis 49:31 we have Shama Kavru et Avraham wa et Sara Ishto. There, T H E R E, they buried, Cal perfect third common plural, Abraham and his wife Sarah. And the second line, Shama Kavru et Yitzchak wa et Rivka Ishto. There, they buried Isaac and his wife Rebecca. Why is the cow being used here then if you would normally have a plurative since you have more than one person being buried at the time? Well notice where the Athnak is. The Athnak comes at the end of the second line underneath Ishto. That's the logical midpoint. Two long lines followed by a very short line at the end. Weshama Kavrati et Lea, and there I will bury Leah. Jacob is saying he's going to bury Leah in the same place. That statement that he makes is our clue because he's burying one person, Leah. He uses the cow. Why do, do these two take the cow? It's what we call constructio ad sensum a construction according to the sense. These two occurrences are attracted to this one. And so Cal is used because the main point of all of this is not that four people have been buried there. The point of it is Leah is going to be buried there. The whole point of this verse has really nothing to do with Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Rebekah. It has everything to do with Leah. She is the focal point. She is the one that is being focused on and therefore the cow is being used and because the focus is on her, these two forms are attracted to the cow where normally you would expect a PL. All right? So when you have those differences, you have to ask the question. You run across it in your text. You find something that would be normally one way, but you find it a different way and you have to ask why. And then you search for that reason. Okay? <clears throat> Verb aspect and tense. The conjugations do not indicate tense. According to Chisholm on page 86, time frame must be determined contextually. He will tell you that three times in a row. The perfect expresses a simple fact, he says on page 86. The perfect does not express a completed action, a finished action, or a past action. Past action is determined by context, not by the verb form. It does not mean completed. It is simply making a simple factual statement. The imperfect is too difficult to reduce to a simple formula because it has many uses. The focus of the imperfect is not on any single concept. It can be used of expressing moods like the cohortative and the jussive. It can be used to show an action beginning, an action continuing, an action being repeated, an action being finished or brought to completion, culminating. It can be used in a wide variety of ways. And so it's not so simple to identify the imperfect, but it is not talking about something that is incomplete because the imperfect can refer to something that's complete. The label preterite according to Chisholm, is inadequate and inaccurate in some cases. In fact, in a large number of cases. The only place it's accurate is when it's used only in narrative of past action because preterite is just an old English word meaning past tense. That's all it means. And it will only have that meaning if the context is right. If you have a historical narrative, obviously the actions being described that took place in the past are going to be in the past tense. But the Wayik Tol is not a preterite in and of itself. It is inaccurate. It is inadequate to refer to the Wayik Tol form of the verb as a preterite. Chisholm points this out as well as a large number of Hebraists. The Wau consecutive or the Wayik Tol focuses on sequential actions normal to Hebrew narrative. Juan and Muraoka say the Wau mainly adds the idea of succession in the Wayik Tol. Succession, sequence. Another place, this feature of succession, characteristic, 
of the Wayuk Toll. Notice their words. It's characteristic of the Wayuk Toll. Becomes particularly evident when biblical writers deliberately avoid Wayuk Toll and replace it with a wow plus a non-verb followed by a katal, a perfect form of the verb, when they do not want to express succession. The Wayuk Toll is also avoided if the action, although really subsequent, is not represented as such. And they give an example in 1 Kings 2.8. The way it tolls also avoided if the second action is simultaneous, like Genesis 1.5. We're told there, Wayikra Elohim. God named Laor, the light, Yom, day. Wellahoshek Kara Layala. But the darkness he named night. Don't get up and stand in the pulpit and say, that because light is mentioned first as being named, it was named first, therefore it's more important than darkness. Because that is brutalizing and skewing the Hebrew grammar. According to the Hebrew grammar and Joel Moroka and a wide range of other Hebraists, this is simultaneous action. You say, but you can't name two things at the same time. You're not God. Neither am I. But God can name two things at the simultaneous moment, at the same time. The point here is this is simultaneous action. It is not a priority or a list that shows that something has priority over something else. It is merely simultaneous action. They also say, although Wayik Tol, like Katal, is mainly used for the sphere of the past, it is sometimes used also like katal for the present or even for the future, which is exactly what Chisholm reminds us of. Time is determined by context, not by the verb form. They also mention, but always after a verbal form which has previously placed the action in the present or in the future or in the past. In other words, why tolls normally have a lead verb. In Genesis 1, the lead verb is bara in verse 1. The lead verb can be a perfect. The lead verb can be an imperfect. The lead verb can be a participle. The lead verb can be a, an infinitive absolute. The lead verb can be an imperative. The lead verb can be another wayik toll, like in the book of Ruth that begins with two wayik tolls in a row. So it's not adequate to say that it is switched into or converted into the same type of verb as the lead verb. The lead verb only sets the context, that's all. The following Wayuk tolls are not converted into the same verb form. They also say in the case of a repetition, the action cannot be represented as subsequent and therefore Wayuk toll is not used. When you have the same action described twice in a row, the second time it's described, it cannot use the Wayuk toll because the Wayuk toll would indicate sequence which would indicate not two descriptions, but a repetition of the event or act itself. To sum up, after a Wayuk toll, another Wayuk toll is avoided when the action is not successive or is not represented as such. Therefore, the primary characteristic of Wayuk toll is sequence or succession, and therefore we call it a wow consecutive. And that's referring to the entire form of the verb, not just to the conjunction attached to it. That's why its name in Hebrew is Wayiktol. The wa is the conjunction, the yiktol is the imperfect. It is still an imperfect. It's an imperfect with a conjunction with an A-class vowel under it. Wekatal, on the other hand, the wow plus perfect, is a wow correlative. It focuses on logical relationships rather than sequential actions, and it is normal to Hebrew prophetic literature. Joan and Morocco say, in the sphere of the past, wekatal t is very common. The temporal value of the form is brought out by the context only. Notice, time value by context only. Let's take a look at a text and try to figure out if we can the significance of the verb forms because this is what I want you to do in your passages as you're dealing with your syntactical analysis. We have a passage in Judges 5.26. Yadach layateid tishlachna minach Lehalmut emelim, wehalma sisra machakarosho, 
u makatsa wechalpa rakato. What does this mean? First of all, notice yada is her hand. Her hand. La yateid. Yateid is the idea of a peg, a tent peg. Her hand to the tent peg. Tishlachna. Tishlachna cal. Imperfect. Third feminine plural. But you say, wait a minute. Hand is feminine, but there's only one hand here. Her hand. In anticipation of the use of both hands, the plural is being used. All right? So, her hand to the tent peg she sends, or her hand is sent, because it's plural, it's not referring to she. All right? And there's not two women present, so it's hand is the subject. So the cal here is actually being used in a passive sense by context. Her hand is being sent to the tent peg, we minach, and her right hand. So which hand is the first one? The left hand. The context reveals the first hand is the left hand. So we could, we could put in, in italics, put her non-italics because you have a third feminine singular pronominal suffix, left italics because you're assuming it from the context, hand back to non-italics. So her left hand is sent to the tent peg and her right hand to the halmut, that's the hammer, all right? The hammer of the workman, emelim. All right, the hammer of the workman. So what do we have here? We're near Hollywood, right? Just down the freeway here a little bit, a little over the hill. You get to Hollywood, go down to Hollywood and Vine, go down by Gorman's Chinese Theater, go down there and take, or, or whatever it's called. I don't think it's Gorman, is it? Grumman's, Grumman's. See, I've got to get right. I don't spend a lot of time down there. <laughs> when we have visitors, we take them there. But other than that, we hardly ever go. In Hollywood, when they're making movies, you have a script. The script gives instructions as to how things are to be filmed, right? So if you are filming an episode of CSI and you're watching this take place, the episode of CSI is going to get into all the nitty gritty details and show more than what anyone ever wanted to see, all right? The biblical text does not give that type of imagery. In CSI, when someone has a tent peg put through their brain, you see the tent peg, you hear the sound of it being struck by the hammer, you watch it sink down into the brain, and then you have these special effects that show it going through the brain, showing the spurting of blood everywhere, the, the cranium being cracked and broken open, and parts of brain coming out, and you watch it go through and sink itself into the ground underneath his head. The writer here does not describe it that way. You see, imperfects describe the action in process. They look at the action internally, not externally. Perfects look at the actions as a simple fact, a simple state, and they look at them externally as a whole, without regard to the internal nature of the action. And I'll illustrate that in this text in a second. Yes? Uh, maybe this is not a good idea to do, but is this, this a different language, but is this kind of like the aortist in, in Greek? Like it's more like the aorist? aorist. Uh, no, it's not, not exactly like. Don't try to make the Greek verb forms similar to or e equal to the Hebrew verb forms. There's too many differences. Okay? The closest you can come with the aorist probably is the wayik toll by itself in narrative. And yet, that doesn't do any good because the aorist is called a horizo for a reason. It's without boundary. It can be used of absolutely anything. Uh, the aorist is the trash verb in Greek. No matter what you want to say, no matter what kind of action, the aorist can do it. All right? It's the jack of all trades. Okay? It, it comes close to an imperfect, but the imperfect doesn't go that far. All right. So what do we have? We have an imperfect. So what is it doing? If you're filming this scene... The way the author describes it is telling you, focus the camera on Jael's hands. Don't focus it on her. Don't focus it on his head. 
Don't focus on what's going to happen. You focus on her hands because the imperfect here, tishlak na, is being used in order to show the action in process and that's what you want to see on film. You want to see her right hand reach out and grab, uh, or excuse me, left hand first. You want to see her left hand reach out and grab the tent peg. Then you want to see her right hand reach out and grab the hammer and you want to see the hammer and the tent peg meet and that's all you're going to see of what happens because notice what it does after that. That's the Athnach and next we come to where Halma Sisra Machakaro show and she struck a perfect Cal perfect third feminine singular Sisera the direct object Machaka and she crushed Cal perfect third feminine singular Rosho the direct object his head Umachatsa and she shattered Cal perfect third feminine singular and she pierced with halpa, the Cal perfect third feminine singular, rak, rakato, his, some say cranium, some say temple, it's part of the head. All right? Why the perfect's being used? Because it's a simple stated fact. What do you see on film then? You don't see on film. You do not see the tent peg enter his head. You do not see the crushing of his head. You do not see the shattering of his head. You do not see the piercing of his head. You hear the sound. And the camera might show you a shadow in the background of the action. And they might just show you a couple drops of blood on the fabric of the tent. But you will not see a CSI moment here. Why? Exegetically, what's the significance of this? Expositionally, what's the significance of this? The perfects tell you that those are just the simple stated facts of the situation. Looked at as a whole. They are not important. The important part is the imperfect. That part you put on film. That part you want to focus on. Because the real importance of this whole description is that Jael took action. She did something about the situation. She sent her hands to do this work. Her hands grasped the tent peg and the hammer. She is the one who slew Sisera. Not the sh soldiers on the field. Not a man. Not her husband. She did it. So when you're preaching this text, don't focus on the gore. Don't focus on a description that goes into all the details like a CSI episode of what happened to Sisera's head. Because that's not significant. That's just a simple stated fact looking at the situation as a whole. Let it go. The real focus is on the fact that she took action. We see her in the process of taking that action. The film will show her action and that's the important part. And when you're preaching on it, you've got to focus on her. You've got to focus on what she did. You've got to focus on why she did it. You've got to focus on why no one else did it. That's the point, you see. So when you're doing your text and you're dealing with the perfect, what does your perfect talk about? What is the exegetical significance of your perfect in your text in giving a simple statement of fact, looking at the situation or condition as a whole? Where are the imperfects and how are the imperfects being used? Are they showing the process of the action? Are they showing the mood of the action? Are they, are they showing the would, should, could, or can, might, how are they in it? How are they involved? The imperfects are what the camera is going to pick up in a film being made by someone who understands the way the verbs are being used in the Hebrew text. Does that help you a little bit? Go back and read the section I gave you on the Hebrew verb. I've gone through this in detail and you can take a look at it in the syllabus. We can look at uh, Psalm 16.9, Lakain Samach Libi, therefore, Samach Libi, my heart rejoices, a Cal perfect, a simple statement of fact that his heart rejoices. But in the very next line, Wayagil Kavodi, here you have a Wayik Tol in poetry. 
and it's showing sequence. So that as a result of my heart being happy, my soul rejoices. Okay? And then, af, the emphatic particle, indeed my flesh dwells, yishkon, and imperfect, securely. What's the focus in this verse? Well, the first half of the verse is focusing on joy, internal joy. And the joy of the uh, uh, soul there, his, what's called his glory, my glory, is the result of his having a happy heart. You can ask, how do you have a happy heart? It appears that that is a responsibility of the believer to have a happy heart. We are in charge of our happiness. If we are depressed, it's partly our fault. We've allowed circumstances to get control of us. But if we keep a happy heart, a healthy heart, then our very inner being will rejoice even in the midst of trial. And indeed, our body, our flesh, will dwell securely. And here's the focal point of the verse. The imperfect is the action being filmed. It's how do I live in this body? How do I live on this earth under this sun? That's the point of this verse. And I will dwell securely if I keep my heart happy. And we don't keep our hearts happy by feeding our lusts and fulfilling our desires of the flesh. We keep our heart happy by keeping it in tune with God and his will and many other things. Three different forms of the verb. All three have a different function here. The first just states a simple fact. The second states a sequential result of the first fact. And the last is the focal point on how we then must continue to live. How should we then continue to live? Volitional forms, we already talked about na, so I won't go through that here. Uh, Genesis 13, verse 9. Uh, Is not all the land before you separate immediately from me? If to the left or to the right, uh, if to the left, I will go to the right, and if to the right, then I will go to the left. Why the na there? Abraham is not telling Lot please separate from me. He's saying do it now. Why? They'd had a problem. There was uh, a occurrence of a uh, fight between their herdsmen. And he's saying let's stop this right now. The na is a sense of urgency. It's not a sense of, uh, of saying please. He's telling his younger nephew Abraham is senior. He's saying get out of here now. I don't want this to continue. You choose where you want to go. I'll go the other way. 